What's up, New Life? How's it going? Welcome to New Life at the Training Center. My name's Brandon. If we haven't met, just uh, want you to know I'm so glad to be here. I was the youth pastor here over a decade ago, so you know you were in my youth ministry if you're like 30 with three kids, right? Like that's, that's, how, that's what happened to you. And so uh, luckily I didn't age at all, so that's great. So, okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, just so glad to be with you. One of the things I love about New Life is that we are one church in many locations. And so I've been leading the Bainbridge Island campus for the last nine years. And uh, on this Easter, just like all of our campuses, uh, we had one of the largest Easter's we've ever had at Bainbridge Island. It was super awesome. And I know we did here as well. Uh, one of the stories that I thought it'd be kind of fun to share is, you know, we're doing the mission together. It doesn't matter whether, matter whether you're here or there, is on Easter uh, morning, uh, you know, at this campus, uh, Wes uh, had a FaceTime, like, or a, a, what do you call it? Um, he had a Facebook Live event, and so uh, this campus was all over Facebook, and uh, uh, after the third gathering, this woman came up to me, and she goes, you know, I woke up this morning, and I had nowhere to go for Easter. She goes, it was going to be like the first Easter I ever met, missed. And she said, you know, when you don't plan to go to church on Sunday morning, you wake up and you check Facebook. I was like, oh, I didn't know that because I'm always a pastor at church, right? And I was like, so that's what they're doing. That's interesting. No, I just can't. not joking. And so, uh, so she's, she's on there. She sees Wes speaking on the Facebook live event, watches the sermon, loves it, looks on our website, realizes that there's an 11... 40 gathering at Bainbridge Island she can go to. So she gets in her car. She drives there. She comes. She's like, I love it. I'm coming back. This is my church. Like, I fit. And I just thought, you know what? That's the whole church working together to make a difference. And I want you to know, as someone who's been a part of this location, who's been at that location, that your work, your effort, your heart for the other campuses makes a huge difference. And so thank you so much for that. You're leading the way. Uh, today we walk into um, our third week of a series called Change the Story, and we're talking about eight lies that Jesus wants you to stop believing. And we want to look at these lies because I, I believe this. In order to change the story, we have to change what we believe, because what we believe leads to what we do. What we think determines how we act. And I think sometimes we think we can skip the step. And if you've ever tried to change something, like go on a diet or something like that, you'll know this. You can white knuckle it for a little while, but you won't make it very long until you deal with what's up here, what you're thinking about, what you're focused on. You know, when I was a kid, I believed I was invincible on a BMX bike. That's what I thought. And uh, I got in an argument in the Leeds meeting about what the greatest 80s movie of all time was. So with all the leads there, and someone says, the greatest 80s movie of all time was Dirty Dancing. And I was like, Dirty Dancing? Right? Okay, how many here? You're like thinking, man, it could be Dirty Dancing. Like, that could be, I know it's church. We're not supposed to be talking about Dirty Dancing. Right? I get it. But come on, who liked it? Be honest. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Can we be real in church? Come on. Okay. And so, so I told her, hey, you know, you're dead wrong. Okay? Not even top 50. Greatest mo 80s movie of all time is hands down Top Gun. Hands down. Who's with me on that, right? So it got me thinking about my favorite 80s movie, and I remembered an 80s movie. It's a little-known movie. You basically have to be like, you know, 44 to 39 years old in order to know this movie even existed. It was called Rad. Anybody out there? Come on. Now, Top Gun is men with fighter planes, okay? Rad is basically boys with BMX bikes, it's the same thing, same, same movie, it's just BMX bikes and, and junior high boys, right? And so I love that movie, and so after that meeting, when we talked about the movies, my friend texted me this, and everything started to make sense in my life. It says, if you watch this movie as a kid, there's a 95% chance you suffered a BMX-related bike injury. <laughs> I was like, that makes so much sense. In first grade, I remember um, uh, in a bike race, flying over my handlebars, and I broke my femur. Look at that right there. That was me right there. Three-quarter inch body cast, right? I had five weeks of traction. Next year, I got on the same bike and raced down a hill, went flying off of it. My face was like hamburger, just absolutely messed up. The next year, I watched the movie Thrasher which is basically the same movie on a skateboard. 
And then I tried to go down that same hill on a skateboard. You know, when you're going about 20 miles on a skateboard and you try and step off, you cannot run as fast as that skateboard. You cannot. It's just boom right there, man. And so, like, I saw that stat and I thought, that explains my life. Forever I believed I was invincible, the guy from Rad on my BMX bike, and it was killing me. And I just wonder, what are the things we believe that are hurting us, that are not realistic, that don't fit, that, that, that it's just like, you know, I believe this, but I don't know if it's true. The thing about a lie is there's enough truth to it that it begins to deceive us. And Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is my prayer for the whole series. We're spending eight weeks on this. We're three weeks in. That God would begin to deal with the things in our mind that are not true. Here's why. I want you to be free. Jesus wants you to be free. Free to believe the things that matter, that are true, that are right. Some of us, man, we've been stuck for so long. And we need to be set free from that. I think we get these old lies, and these old lies develop patterns patterns of thinking, and we're so familiar, we're so used to them that we don't even know they're not true. Paul wrote, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to see us transformed, completely transformed, totally new, totally changed from the inside out. On the first week of the series, we invited people to take a three by five note card and write down the lie that they are tempted to believe. And so I thought about it for a while. I prayed about it. I don't like to ask you to do things I don't do. I don't think that's fair. And so I prayed about it, and I wrote down on my 3 by 5 note card, I can't make a difference. It's the lie I'm most tempted to believe. There are times in my life where I just feel like I don't know if I can make a difference. And I began thinking about it, and I realized this. The enemy will lie to you on the area that's your greatest potential. And I wonder if there's a lie that you believe that is keeping you from your greatest potential. That throughout this series, God would reveal it to you. And my prayer, my invitation to you is somewhere along the way, God might reveal that lie to you. And you can just write it down right on the back of your card and just say, this is the lie that I'm dealing with, I'm tempted to believe, and it's robbing me from my greatest potential. And I want to see Jesus speak truth in it. The way you deal with lies is you bring truth in it. For the last two weeks since I've been thinking about this, I've been saying over and over again, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm taking that truth and driving it into my heart. And what's the true statement you need to say over and over again that will give you the confidence to know that Jesus can use you? Today, lie three that we're going to be looking at is this, is what I have isn't enough. I'm going to take a second and talk about what I have isn't enough. We're going to talk about this feeling of lack. Now, I looked up the definition of the word enough in the dictionary, and it says it's this feeling that your needs or expectations are not fully met. Now, I thought with that definition, all of us are like, well, I don't have enough. The feeling that my needs and expectations are fully met. There's no one here that's like, yep, check that box. I feel great. Family, friends, fine. It's just, it's all just, it's fully met. Now, somewhere, everywhere, one of us can point out a lack. We actually all have this relationship, this feeling to the word enough. You might not even know you have it, but you do. And it comes down to how you feel about whether you feel like you have a little or you feel like you have plenty. Right? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if I did, every one of us would have a feeling right now about whether you have a little or whether you have plenty. I call it tuna casserole and steak. Because early on in my life, I had a lot of what my wife and I call our tuna casserole years. Right? We were young married, just getting started. I was working at the tuxedo club. I wasn't making very much money, and we were trying to make it work. And there was a lot of tuna casserole. I hate tuna casserole to this day. (laughs) I just do. And some of you, maybe you're right now, you're in your tuna casserole years, and you just feel, I don't have very much. It's funny, is even in the tuna casserole years, I look back and think, those are some of the greatest years of my life. Didn't matter that we had a little. We were living on love. (laughs) 
But I just think there are times in our life where our focus becomes on what we lack. I remember um, this word enough is a moving target. You can feel like you have enough for a little while. For instance, uh, in, uh, I, I've owned a 2003 Honda Civic for the last seven years. And that little Honda Civic has been enough for me for the last seven years. Well, about three months ago, it broke down. And I told my wife, I think it's got energy for one more ride. One more ride to the dealership when I know what car I want to get. Have you ever taken one of those rides before? It's like, I think we'll make it. And so, I kid you not, last weekend we get in the car and we drive it to the dealership. I make it down Loxie Egan. I get to a four-way stop and the car dies three blocks from the dealership. I'm like, oh, and I get out of the car. There's literally some rude person. I hope they're not in this building honking at me. I'm like, the car's dead. Can't you tell? Like, and so I'm like trying to wave them by, come through. And I like pray a prayer. And I'm like, God, let it start. It started again after five minutes. I drive it. I pull it into the dealership. I park it in a parking lot. I give the key to a guy and say, take it. I never want to see it again. Like, I'm done with that thing. They gave me 500 bucks for it. And trust me, I got a great deal on that. <laughs> that car forever has been enough for me. Now, I got to tell you, you're probably better than me, but I'm tempted by new shiny things. My wife, she's a rock star, cold, doesn't even, not even going to look at them. But you know how the dealerships work? They have the nicest cars right at the front. And so I'm at the Honda dealership, and they have the 2018 Honda Accord sport in red, the color that all cars are meant to be painted in. <laughs> and my eyes are bugging out of my head, and I'm like, Janine, this could be our new car. So we take it for a drive, and I'm suddenly realizing there's things that I've been lacking in my life I didn't know I was lacking. I didn't, need, I didn't know that you needed heated seats. Or cold seats, you can control, they can get colder. A steering wheel that warms when you need it to warm, a heated, did you even know? I didn't even know I wanted that. I want it. And we're driving it, and the guy shows me this thing to this day, I still think is the greatest invention on earth. It's called um, driver's assist. Ooh, yeah, driver's assist. So it's the next level of cruise control, right? You set it, and you set your speedometer, and if you're behind a car, it will slow with the car. It'll speed up. It'll trail them. You don't have to do nothing. It is awesome. I need that. <laughs> Suddenly, I was like, I need everything about this car, and we park. We get out. My wife is just rock star. I don't need that. No, I don't want it. I'm like, well, I don't know if I like you right now. And, <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, I go home, I pencil the numbers, I'm doing the budget, there's fire coming out of my budget, right? And I tell my wife, I think we can afford this car, it's right to the edge of our budget, but I think we can do it, honey, what do you think? She's like, well, I'm going to ask you to go look at all the used cars first, and then if we don't see anything else, that'll be the one we get. And I thought, this is a trick. <laughs> this, she's tricking me, she always tricks me. And so we get, we get there, and I tell the guy, I want the car, but my wife's going to make me look at the used cars, right? Which is, you know, what we had to do. And so, so we look at them, and when you believe there's a 2014, four years older, Honda Accord Sport for $10,000 less. Dollars. And she's starting to think that's the responsible decision. And I'm thinking, this does not have driver's assist. <laughs> I mean, how much is driver assist worth? I don't know. Heated seats. Let me ask you this. You can write this on your card, okay? How old do you have to be to have leather seats? I'm 42. I think I'm there. Apparently not yet. So we got that car, and turns out it's enough. Here's what I'd like to say. Whether it's a car whether it's a cell phone, whether it's tuna casserole or steak. We all have this relationship to enough. And sometimes that relationship gets in the way of our relationship with Jesus. And what I want us to do today is actually kind of go big picture and look at 
What does that struggle mean or reveal about who we think God is? Do we believe Jesus is enough in our life? Do we believe that he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory? Can we trust that he actually knows better for us than what we need? Here's the problem. When we believe that we don't have enough, we begin to focus on we don't, what we don't have. It's actually called the sin of envy. If you draw a circle, and this is everything you possess, and you point to what's outside the circle and say, this is what would make me happy, driver's assist. What happens is envy rots you from the inside out. The scriptures actually say envy rots the bones. And here's why. The thing you can't control is what you think will make you happy. God always wants to bring us back to what we do have and be able to look at that and actually understand there's a surplus there, an abundance there that he's actually provided for us. What happens is when we define what is good as what we do not possess, we create a scarcity mentality. It's this feeling that I fear that I will lose what I have and I compare what others have against what I have. And notice, you always compare someone who has more. You never compare someone who has less. And it begins to create these feelings of discontentment inside our heart. And what happens is this, is we move towards greed and scarcity in terms of, in, instead of generosity and joy. And what happens is we end up becoming stingy. And I believe that at the heart of the gospel is that we serve a generous God who wants us to know that he provides everything we will ever need, that it's on, his, it's on him, it's with him. He has provided for us every day of our life to this point, and we need to trust that. For God so loved the world that he gave. It started with his generosity. Now, I realize that when I talk about this, what naturally comes to mind is money. But the truth is, that's often not at the heart of what we feel like we lack could be an area of relationship, could be kind of a job or a status or an opportunity or a place or living in this location or having this kind of house or this kind of, I don't know what it is, but inside of our heart, there's times where we get focused on what we don't have and we start to feel like we don't have enough. Paul believed that we could live on little or plenty. He wrote this, he said, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I can live on tuna casserole or steak. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. Paul says this, no matter where you're at, whatever station you're light in, you can be fulfilled. You can know that you have enough in every situation. We're going to look at a passage in John chapter 6. It's this moment in Jesus' life where he gathers a crowd together. They're following him, and it says in the scriptures that Jesus had compassion on the crowd. In verse 5, it says, Jesus saw such a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? What an inter Hey, Philip, see these like 10,000 people out here? Where do we buy bread for it? It says he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. I circled that word testing. I wonder if there's situations in our life where we feel like we don't have enough, and it's actually a situation God has brought about, just like Jesus was testing Philip, could he be testing you? And we can actually see the response of the disciples, and I think it reveals a little bit of our heart and our desire. See, Jesus turned to Philip. Why did he turn to that disciple? Well, one, Philip is from Bethsaida, which is a town about nine miles away from where they were. So if any one of the disciples knew where to buy food, it'd be Philip. So Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. I underline that word, even if. When Jesus tests us, there's going to be a moment where we say, Jesus, even if I worked my whole life, I would never be able to have what they had. I'd never be able to provide what they could provide. Even if, if we have a statement like that. 
And here's where that statement comes up from. It comes from our focus on what we have, what we possess, what we're in charge of, what we're in control of. And we have to turn the arrows out and say, what could Jesus do with what I have? Now, there was another disciple. His name's Andrew. There's always an Andrew. You're supposed to like Andrew. You don't like Andrew. You're like, Andrew always sees the bright side. Ugh. It says, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? So he sees this boy. He's got a small lunch. Now, I like to picture the two fish as two king salmon, but they don't live in the Northwest, and it's most likely a very poor person's lunch. Just the fact that it mentions barley loaves. Most people then would still want wheat. Barley was the food that you fed animals or someone who was very poor. And likely the fish were just small enough that it would fit inside of a sandwich for him to be able to eat. And so Jesus sees this boy's lunch. The boy gives Jesus his lunch. And then Jesus tells everyone to sit down. So he, num he, he sat down, and then they sat down on these grassy slopes, and they numbered about 5,000 men. And then now they get to see what Jesus is going to do with this boy's lunch. In verse 10, it says, Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish, and they ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten them from five barley loaves. They ate and they had leftovers. So when the people saw him do these miraculous signs, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. It was this miracle moment. The truth that I want us to walk away from here is this, is Jesus makes a big difference with what I give. Do you believe that in your heart? Jesus makes a big difference with what I give. I honestly think we struggle to believe it. I think there's a little part of us that thinks that we're going to give Jesus our lunch and he's just going to sit down and eat it. Man, this is really good. Thanks. <laughs> Could you imagine if he did that to that boy? Like, wow, thank you. I was hungry. I think sometimes people feel like that's what happens when you give to the church. It's just like, oh, here, thanks. I ate your lunch. That's not at all what Jesus did. Jesus actually gave the boy an opportunity to make a difference. And I believe this, there's something that happens when we believe that Jesus can do more with our lunch than we can. It changes us. It changes how we think. The first thing I wrote down is this, is I am willing to give up what I think I need. It's a good question to ask yourself, am I willing to give up what I think I need? That word need is important. Need zeroes in on our desires, what we think is most important, what we care about. It's the things that we're trying to hang on to. My favorite psalm is Psalm 23. Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That part right there, it gets me every time. I shall not want. In, in want says, I have all I need. It's this picture of a sheep in a pasture with the good shepherd, Jesus. And the sheep knows that I'm safe, I'm cared for, I'm protected because the Lord is my shepherd. Some of us, we just need to write that on the top of our page. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You have all you need. He is with you. He is providing for you. He's there. It takes the pressure off. Some of you, you feel so much pressure right now. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. The second thing is this. Prepare for God to do something bigger than I can do. I noticed in the Gospel of Mark, when Mark retold the story, Jesus had the crowd sit down in groups of 50 and 100. He brought order to the chaos. Maybe you're here and there's a lot of chaos in your life. It just happens, right? I mean, if you've got kids, you've got chaos. It's just how it works. And maybe in the middle of that chaos, God wants to actually begin to prepare to do something. To do anything great, you have to prepare to do it. Even the simple things in life. My son turned 16. My wife and I threw him a birthday party yesterday. There's 15 boys in our house. It takes preparation. You have to put a lot of pads up in your house to make sure that those boys, right? You know, you have to prepare. And we 
actually had a lot of joy in that preparation because we wanted to surprise and bless him. You know, those are the kind of gifts that come out of a generous heart. They take planning. To do anything significant, you have to plan to do it. My wife and I, early on in our marriage, decided that we would tithe 10%. And so in our journey, it was actually the first time in my entire life I had ever wrote a budget. Because I actually had to make the decision that I'm going to choose to live on less than what I made. And what turned out to be the reward wasn't that money rained down from heaven. It's actually turned out if you make the commitment to live on less than what you make, you won't get into debt. Because you're like, it's hard to get into debt when you're living on less than what you have. It was actually a major step of maturity in my journey. And it was this belief that as I give my, God my lunch, that, that 90% with me and 10% with God would be more than just 100% with me. It was just this belief in my life. And I found it to be true throughout my entire life. In fact, that's the money that I'm most excited to give because I know this, it's an internal investment and it means this, that other people get to eat, other people get to experience the power of Christ in their life and I get to be a part of that. And I had to eliminate chaos in order to get ready to do that. And here's what I think it does. It actually eliminates anxiety and worry and fear. When you're living right on the razor edge, there's a lot of fear and an anxiety in that. And maybe God might be speaking to you to take a step and say, what does it look like for you to trust God with your lunch? Here's what happens. When you trust God with your lunch, other people eat. It brings joy. That's the third thing I wrote down. Other people get to have their needs met. There's something that jumps out to me as I read this. It's like they ate as much as they wanted. Jesus sent them home with doggy bags. It was this understanding that God was actually meeting them in abundance. I think sometimes we think this, well, God doesn't just want me to have very much, and so if I just trust him, then I'm going to have even less. That wasn't what happened at all. They ate as much as they wanted. I believe this, the solution to greed is generosity. It kills greed every time. It kills fear every time, and it brings joy every time in our life. One of the greatest times of life is Christmas. I love Christmas because you see generosity everywhere you look, and it brings so much joy in the hearts and lives of people. The fourth thing that I wrote down is this, is God gives me more than I gave him. Do we truly believe that? God gives more than I gave. Think about it. The boy gives his lunch. It's not like the boy didn't eat. The boy ate too, and so did everybody else. Jesus says, gather the leftovers so they're not wasted. If you're here, maybe the first step you need to take is to say, I want to make myself available to God. I want to trust that God will do what he said he will do, that God will provide the things that he said he would provide. Remember, I said at the very beginning that Philip was being tested. Maybe today you're being tested like Philip, and it'll be a moment for you to say, God, I trust you with my lunch. Can you imagine being in the crowd, eating there, sharing the loaves and fishes? Everybody ate, there's leftovers. And then there's this moment where Jesus stands up to that crowd that is full. And he says to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. And just sitting in that crowd and say, yep, that's true. He provided for me. He met my needs. Maybe there's been a time in your life where God's provided and met your needs, and it'd be a moment for you to say, God, you provided for me then, and I believe you'll provide for me now. My closing question is simply this. What is God asking you to give, to give up, or give away? Maybe there's a step for you where you would say, this is my next step. God's leading me to give, to give up, or give away. I'm not sure what that next step is, but I encourage you to write it down. We have a habit at New Life of taking a moment with the connection card. And it's a moment for us to write down what God's doing in our life. Here's why. I think it changes your Monday. Sometimes you can walk out with some good thoughts and it doesn't change anything. You find yourself going through the motion. So I want to invite everybody, go ahead and pull out the connection card. Let's just take a moment and look at it. I put my name down. I filled it out. Maybe your first or second time guest. I checked on the mission for me. <coughs> But you'll see here it says, I want to say yes to Jesus. 
Maybe for you, this would be a moment where you need to declare that you believe Jesus is the bread of life, that he is your good shepherd, that he can be trusted, that you can trust him with your lunch. Whatever you feel like you're lacking, you can confess that to God and trust that he will provide it for for you. And maybe you would check, I want to say yes to Jesus. The second one is God is asking me to join the giving team. There's people every month that jump in on this team that are a part of it. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I need to check that box. I need to trust God with my lunch. This will be a step of obedience for me and God will lead me. The third one is this, is send me some scriptures on overcoming fear. This is our heart as a church, is that we would help you eliminate the chaos in your life. Say, Brandon, I'm not ready for number two, but I need to actually take a moment and begin to prepare and trust the Lord is with me. I need to check that box. We want to fill any lies with truth about who God is, where he's leading you, and how he's guiding you. Maybe you need to check that because you need to focus in on the scriptures this week. And the fourth one is sign me up for growth tracks. And you see there's an option there to choose the one in May, the May one day, or June. I gotta tell you, Growth Tracks is in my heart. I was actually on the team that helped lead and produce Growth Tracks. And my heart is this, is that everyone in our church would be on the same page. Growth Tracks isn't just for someone who's new it is, but it's really for our whole church to say this, I feel like Jesus picked me, I'm one of the 12, I'm going on the mission with him, and I believe that I can live at my full potential. Our heart is this, is that every one of us would be at our full potential, knowing who God is, how God is leading you and directing you and guiding. Growth Tracks isn't about the church, it's about you. It's about your growth, it's about your learning. Every week you get a chance to say, God, how can I grow and know you more? My hope is this, is that everyone this summer would sign up and do Growth Tracks. It'd be a time for you to learn and grow in your faith with God. I want to encourage you to take that step. Check that box. I'm going to invite you to grab this in your giving envelope. And if you would, take a moment and go ahead and stand up. We're going to close in prayer today. In just a few minutes, they'll come and they'll pass by the buckets. But I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for two groups of people today. I want to pray first for those that are here today that they feel an incredible amount of pressure to provide. I know what that feeling feels like. I remember when my family moved from Tri-Cities to here. We sold our house and we moved into a new house that my family affectionately called the Mildew House. I remember my son, he was like six at the time. He said to me, Dad, I miss our old house. And I had this feeling of, I don't know if I'm providing for my family. I don't know that my family's needs are totally met. And some of you are there right now today. And I want to pray that you would be able to hand over those feelings to the Lord and trust that he will fully supply all of your needs, that he can do what you can't do. He's in control. That you would announce and believe, God, I will never be hungry again. I will never be thirsty again because you are my Lord. I'm not trusting in my job or my career. I'm not trusting in my, I'm trusting in you. You are my good shepherd. I shall not want. I want to pray for you. The second group is for people that check that box saying, I'm going to trust God and take steps towards generosity. I'm going to pray that God would bless you, give you strength, wisdom, that as you prepare to make that choice is that God would show you that he is going to multiply the work and effort you're doing. And so, Father, we come today. And I pray, Lord, first for those that are here today that feel an immense amount of pressure. God, I pray right now that you would go to them, that you'd bring comfort, support, God, that they would know that they are not alone in this, that you are with them. God, you see their need, you see their lack, and you will be the one to bridge it. So God, I pray for new opportunities, new paths. God, I pray for direction. God, I pray you would give them courage to trust in you. God, as they hand you their launch and say, God, I believe you can do more with this than me. God, that they would transfer over the weight from themselves to you. God, that they would run with faith and courage, believing that you're going to be at work in every situation of their life. And God, I pray for those that are taking a step of generosity today. God, I pray you'd give them strength. God, I pray you'd give them courage. God, that as they walk in this faith, God, that you would continue to open doors from heaven for them, that you'd be at work in their life every day. We ask this in your name. Amen.